There's no secret. There's no shortcut. Everything that is alive is conscious. Be silent. Be still and know God. Until you feel worthy, it ain't going to happen. Rigorous, ruthless, disciplined focus. You have to get to a place where you can work on yourself. Well, what's up, ladies and gentlemen, wherever you might be around the world. Of course, I am Jay Campbell, and you're watching the Jay Campbell, Hunter Williams, and Laura Knight Yadchik podcast it's only taken me five episodes to pronounce her last name correctly laura and hunter how are you i'm fine i'm good beautiful yeah, things I am a, so it is a beautiful sunday excited. actually it's a beautiful saturday i can't even keep my day straight here in tampa florida today on april 6th and as we both or all three of us know it is impressive times or unprecedented times depending on your viewpoint um, this is again episode five of a very deep dive interview about Laura's life, uh, works, writings, authorship, and a lot of other things. Um, and the first four interviews have been, I mean, what would you say, Hunter? Profound, I think, is the, really the only word that comes to mind. Earth shaking, and hopefully for the people listening, uh, if this is your first exposure to her work, destabilizing because destabilizing in a good way, because uh, I think that's what is necessary for a lot of people right now um, as we try to navigate what's going on in the world. So definitely both of those. Yeah, uh, that's a really well good way to say it. Um, so I think we'll start the show today. I mean, there's been so many things. It's kind of hard to recap all the stuff. I mean, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let my team do all of that when they go through all of these different episodes. And uh, as you said, Laura, I think it's best to just let them run native, which we'll do. But, you know, we'll We'll remove some parts that we know we need to remove and um, and we'll let it go. But I think the first question today, I think, is really relevant to what we all have been in the background talking about just in the last you know couple of weeks since we it's actually been three weeks since we last convened um, due to travel and due to some medical stuff that all of us are dealing with. Um, but the undergrounders. Right. So you've sent us recently the articles that you wrote <laughs> It's unbelievable. Back in 2002, about, I think it was a, a dark night in Tibet or journey into a dark night in Tibet or whatever that book that was written in the thirties from whomever that pen name or Zoom name was, pseudonym. And, and Hunter and I read all those articles. And of course, we've already read the C's or the Cassiopeian Substack, which Jared, if I'm pronouncing his name correctly, has been putting together articles. So all of those tied together, if I was to summarize What's actually happening is it seems like, and obviously we have the books, right? We have the Wave series and and, and some of your other books. And uh, and and oh, by the way, we're about 145 pages into this book now, Political Powerology, and it's melting my brain. Um, but the, the the if the overarching narrative of the undergrounders for the person, the lay person who doesn't know what we're talking about, is that there is essentially a race of, I guess human beings and others living underground or living in inner earth or under the earth or however you want to phrase it, hollow earth or so many different phraseologies of it. Um, can you kind of just explain like what is the, what is going on in say the inner earth? I would say that it's probably hyperdimensional. I don't necessarily think it's like a, a there are parts of it that are three-dimensional, like a third density or whatever. But I would say that most of it is like uh, some kind of other dimensional space. And that these beings are hyper-dimensional or ultra-terrestrial, as you might call it. Um, so it's, it's not exactly what people ordinarily think of. You know, they're... There's a, there's a an American theologian or history of theology. Uh, her name is Pasilka, and she wrote a book called American Cosmic. You might want to write that down. Um, and she's you know an academic, and she's done a lot of research into the whole UFO, alien, whatever phenomenon. And <clears throat> she was uh, doing an interview, I believe, with Joe Rogan just recently. Wow. And you might want to check that out because in this interview, you know, she points out that uh, 
very bravely that you know when people are talking about UFOs or whatever that that obviously there is something that is not in our reality, you know, not directly in our reality. It's it's in other reality. It's in, uh, in another dimensional space, and it draws from our reality and from its own reality and somehow manifests things that seem to be totally physical and material in our reality, but it may not be entirely. And uh, Joe Rogan's eyeballs crossed. <laughs> so, but, you know, she she's kind of onto that. And, and if you think about it also, there was this guy, uh, what was the guy's name that uh, recently came out and testified before Congress? Grush. Oh, right. David, yeah, David Grush. Old Grush, you know, he gets out there. Nobody questioned his credential in these hearings. Um, and he just, you know, basically was saying, yeah, there are captured craft and there were biologics. Were found, and then, you know, senators are asking questions. Now, okay, next question. They ask him a question. We'll talk about it in closed session. Right. Uh, okay, next question. You know, the media, you know, basically crickets. And, you know, the and Joe Rogan show, you know, which goes out to many millions of people. I think it's one of the most popular uh, podcasts. He has the largest audience on the planet. Yeah. And, and so it basically she's telling people that there are ultra terrestrials interacting with our environment, with our people, et cetera. And basically, you know, crickets. And this basically tells you that there is not ever going to be you know, anything like full disclosure in the sense mm -hmm. of what some of these people are hammering and, and haranguing for. So when you talk about undergrounders, you have to be careful that you don't get into like some kind of panic mode and think that there is like, you know, a bunch of, uh, you know, a race of orcs or something that are going <laughs> to... Cave trolls. Cave trolls. Yeah, that are going to come pouring out of the underground or whatever. You know, this sort of, th there's, there's interdimensional uh, parameters here. So you can't just take everything as, you know, cut and dried, third, third density, three-dimensional. I mean, for example, you know, you're, you're, you're very fond of the dracominoids. And uh, you, you're really taken by the, you know, 13-foot-tall alligators, you know, wear clothes with holes for their tails, right? Right. Uh, but... Think about it as a hyperdimensional phenomenon. Right. And when you're thinking about that, you also have to realize that sometimes if something presents itself, some part of this phenomenon presents itself, not everybody can see it. That's a good point. And, you know, the most important thing I think that I did when I first gave up my resistance to the very idea of the UFO phenomenon being, you know, anything other than people imagining things or, or swamp gas or <laughs> meteorites or whatever. Um, what I did is what I usually do is, you know, go to the source. I read cases, cases, okay. cases, cases. And that's really what you have to do. You have to read cases. Don't take somebody else's analysis. Don't ever take somebody else's analysis unless you've got a lot of cases under your belt because, you know, that's, you know, one, one person can uh, see a, a particular set of phenomena and interpret it a certain way as, oh, well, it's benevolent. And then another word person can interpret it another way. Well, it's not benevolent or it's, uh, you know, they're trying to communicate something to us or it's symbolic or so on and so forth. You know, forget all that. Just read the cases and try to, see how many things repeat over and over and over again. And sometimes it becomes, it comes down to very, very essential things. Um, but that's the best way to get a, a really good grip on the phenomenon. So yeah, undergrounders. Now the Seas have said some pretty bizarre things about that. I mean, they've talked about wars being uh, situations where they replenish the stock of people underground because they harvest them from battlefields because on battlefields, you know, you can, a lot of people can end up missing and nobody 
makes a big hue and cry about it because, and that's one good way to get a lot of uh, reinforcements. Um, if they go into a hyperdimensional space, even as third density beings, um, things can be very, very different because, you know, if we're third density beings and animals are second density beings, animals and, and we share the same space time, but their reality is, is vastly different from ours, but there is still a lot of crossover and a lot of interaction. So just imagine the same thing between humans and hyperdimensional beings, they're fourth density beings, that there is a lot of, there's some crossover and there's interaction, but I would suggest that their reality is so far different from ours that you can't really relate it directly as second to third and then third to fourth. So they're there. Okay, now they're probably uh, recipients of extremely advanced technology. I mean, in terms of, say, medicine or healing or uh, longevity or harvesting their eggs and sperm and, and using them as, as breeding stock or uh, programming them and sending them out into the world. Or, you know, they could pick somebody up on a battlefield, uh, restore them, send them back, but they're restored in a way that they're completely programmed or they're, or they're, you know, vastly altered so that they reinsert themselves back into their previous life as best they can, but as say an agent in a sense. Right. Right. Um, and there was, there was a guy back how oh, 20 some years ago in the, in the UFO community in Tampa. And he declared that he had been killed in Vietnam and had been picked up by aliens and resuscitated and repaired. And that he had, I think he said he had two hearts and he had black blood and so forth. So I, you know, being the kind of person I am, I said, well, you know, do you have blood tests? You know, can I, can I, uh, you know, can we have somebody, you know, take a sample right here and now? And also why out on the spot? Yeah. You know, so obviously I didn't win any popularity contest with that type of attitude but um yeah he uh that's why you're on the show laura <laughs> yeah so it turned out later on that he, he he admitted to being a fraud but that may not necessarily be true he may be right, the idea right he may be programmed he may not none of the things that he said that were truly outrageous might have been true and they may have been being said just to bring um disrepute on the phenomenon and on the on the that ufo alien abduction community so forth and in fact a lot of what is out there in the ufo alien field and the new age field and so forth exists i think to create noise so that the real right. signal will not be uh perceived so you have to be really careful so anyway back to your undergrounders um, breeding purposes, uh, reins reinserting them back into human society for various reasons. Um, for all we know, all of the, the whole woke liberal crowd. That's all, so, so that was my next question then. So political ponderology yeah. posits that psychopathy, totalitarianism, all these extreme evil, if we classify them in third density terms, evil, negative, pathological, they even have a word. What is it? The pa what is the word panora? What is the word path? It starts with a P. Pathocracy. Pathocracy. Yeah. Um, that this is, could, but could this be from? So my so my real question related to the undergrounders is this: Are the people that at the highest level that we know of? Obviously, there are many many psychopaths, but like you know the Hitlers and the Pol Pots and the Stalins, were they some sort of master piece or final? you know, achievement of like, again, I don't want to call it reptilian, but fourth density hybridization along with underground, uh, you know, just interweaving with the human genome for so long. Cause we know they've been hybridizing bits and pieces of us forever. Yeah. Well, you could say that practically every uh, living being that exists on the planet is something of a hybridization experimental project from uh, a fourth density creators and designers and so forth right um we asked once about we asked more than we, we've asked a number of questions and i suppose 
I hope Harrison, and that's his name, Harrison, by the way, Harrison Keeley, he's doing the C Substack, and he's done a terrific job. He's amazing. I would love to have, we'd love to interview him if you could set that up at some point. That would be amazing. Well, you can, you can. Perfect. I mean, just put him and Hunter next to each other, and they look, they look like twins. <laughs> that's awesome. He's actually in North Carolina, too, I think, so I uh, need to link up with him as well, so. So, yeah, so um, uh, we asked some questions about psychopathy, and we were, I remember we were talking about uh, organic cordals. And remember, organic cordals is, uh, you know, basically in a sense, we're all organic cordals. It's just some of us have something more and something more in potential. Uh, and they said that they were uh, defective. Psychopaths were defective organic cordals. And, you know, and I tracked things back, to, you know, in historical research and came to the conclusion that uh, psychopaths probably uh, were the result of mutations during cataclysmic periods of Earth's history. Um, the C's also talked about deep level punctuators, which we can assume is somebody that comes from the underground realms. Uh, and they're probably, you know, psychopaths, so they could be, you know, specifically engineered in that way. So I think there's no simple answer, but there yeah. is uh, you know, there's a simple answer to anything. I mean, <laughs> think about it. I mean, it's just, everything is just, there. everything is so possible. Everything is so potential in this universe. Yeah. You know, the, the, when you, you have to just take specific cases and examine them and, and try to figure out what you're dealing with. I mean, statistically, you get, you know, broad similarities and, and, and broad patterns and ideas, you know, just like you can statistically have ideas about, say, different ethnic groups of people that they are this way or that way or the other way or, or something or other, because, you know, ethnicity and, and genetics do play a very strong role in personality and, and you know, the way people are uh, intellectually and emotionally and so forth. But it, there's still individual cases. Mm -hmm. And so I think that trying to assign psychopathy to a single uh, origin would be, you know, not giving it its due. However, I do think it has been encouraged breeding, uh, breeding more psychopaths is encouraged i think from a hyperdimensional point of view i think they have uh made it more possible they may even use some of them and send them out as uh, you know like a bull to serve as a bunch of cows and, and produce more psychopaths um they uh well they tend to do that on their own anyway they're you know irresponsible parents they're you know they're sexual psychopaths and so forth but i think that there's a whole heck of a lot of them Running right the show in the U.S. and other Western countries today, I'm not going to lay it completely on the U.S., but it's kind of like capital of SDS, yes. right? Like you said, uh, capital of SDS. Well, well, like how about in in almost human? I, you, you know, your 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 uh, analysis of this guy Einhorn, which I'm surprised I actually wasn't familiar with up until I read the book. But that is one of the most. I mean, I mean Hunter, remember when we were reading about him? And what kind of a psychopath would literally kill a woman and bear and, and put her body in a trunk in his closet and then lie about it pathologically for three years and lie about it so convincingly that he actually believed that she wasn't actually there. And then when they found her, he told people like, do you think that I'm that big of a psycho that I would put a body in a trunk in my closet? I mean, this is some next level, like you said, next level punctuator stuff. <laughs> Yeah, so I, uh, I I mentioned I'm sure that I received emails from him. Wow. Uh, here, <laughs> and so the first one, 24 June, uh, 1999. He says, "Hi, Laura. I would be happy to dialogue with you after going through your comments more carefully." As I think we are essentially in agreement, 
I lived through years of the most fantastic phenomena without ever buying the mythology attached to them. The phenomena were very real and of almost daily occurrence. The myth attached to them was pure projection. But the unknown frightens people, and living in vanilla reality forces people to project. So when the paranormal becomes a daily reality, the desire to have an explanation grows exponentially. It began almost 30 years ago in a very different social climate, and the intel groups were initially freaked. If that different context is not understood, the rest becomes very confusing. More when I have time. Wow. Yeah. I mean, you... that's the introductory letter. How many more did he send you? Three. Because oh, at that point, I cut it off. Right. <laughs> was, so, he, wait a minute, was he in prison at this point when he's corresponding? Uh, no, he, at that point, he was on the run in France. Oh, my God. I think. Uh, then he sent me an addenda and blah, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. And then somebody sent me. Oh, yeah. That's insane. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, it kind of gives you the creeps because it was only after this, and I wondered what he was doing on on this physics discussion group that, you know, or that or the, the group my husband belonged to. And I was, you know, fascinating, fascinated by reading some of these posts and I thought, well, you know, who is, who is this guy? Because I had written comments. I had written comments to the group myself, and that's why he wrote to me was because he read my comments and he I guess he decided I was a great target, right? Yeah. You know? Wow. Somebody who's in, into the paranormal and he could use his mumbo jumbo. And then I started looking him up and then I just freaked. I mean, I just freaked. Dude, that's incredible. Yeah. But he actually used he, he wasn't using a fake name, he was obviously using his his real name. When he was messing with you. Yeah. Jesus Christ, dude. That's insane. I mean, honestly, I'm just like, I got the heebie-jeebies just thinking about that, Hunter. Well, one thing that Laura talks about a lot in that book that she could probably enlighten people to is how psychopaths, especially him, they use these language constructs where they try to sound smart, but they insert the wrong words right. on things and come off of them. And you have a lot of examples. I can't think of any just off the top of my head, but they'll they'll say the wrong words about things. Problems. Yeah. They're they're really yeah. they're they're they use those so much. I mean if if you're if you're sharp and if you if you know what's you know when you're reading and you can catch those, you know that there's something something going on. Right. So yeah, but there there are some studies. Uh uh I, mean, I, I want to just read the sentence to you from the book. The absolute trust that my mother's strong relationship imposed on my psyche. Do I wish to master a woman sufficiently so that she will take care of me as my mother did? Yeah. What would even think like that? Well, at that time too, he was probably also playing off this like whole Freudian thing and like the whole like psychology and a lot of the new age stuff that I didn't realize how intertwined he was with the new age, right. but they do this thing where they use these like call outs and they'll say stuff like that. And then it almost like puts in his case, women in a trance. It's a spell. Like, oh, he's such a guru. He's such a this. And that's going on today with social media people where they'll say these weird it things is. like that. Where if you actually deconstruct it, you'd be like, that's a really weird language construct to tell people. But for whatever reason, and this may relate to harp or other things that like triggers people and they're like, they just become a like blind follower of some of these guru types. And what's weird is like, yeah, of course that guy existed at one time in history where he had this following in the new age or whatever, but there's like many manifestations of that in our current world that's going on today of like all of these people that will like say these things and it triggers people into a trance in some weird way. And then it's like, for us, we look at it and they're like, how could you, think that that person's saying something of value but to them it's like this like god's honest truth that they're hearing well let me let me expand on that so expanding on that for a uh, hunter for laura would be are they doing it on both sides so think about how they have the atheist science trust the science and then you have the jesus freaks so what if they're doing it on both sides? And I mean, you proved again in this book and in, 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 in Almost Human about the CIA mind control programming of the uh, Pentecostals and the, you know, the, deep, the deep Christian, whatever you call it, fundamentalist Christians. Yeah, well, you know, I, I realized this 
even back in the day when I was going to church pretty regularly, um, because, you know, when I was in college, I had trained in hypnotherapy. And I remember sitting there in the, in the church and realizing that the evangelist who was there for a week or whatever, was using very standard hypnotherapy techniques. You know, I mean, they start off with the yes set and when they go into other things and when they get the people in trained, you know, so, but me, you know, I'm sitting there observing what he's doing and thinking to myself, oh my God, how many, how many people are, you know, being taken in by this? You know, I mean, that's, that's what, and what they end up doing in a sort of Pentecostal church, which in, in this case it was, um, they end up getting people, uh, well, what would they call it, into a state of limbic resonance. Yeah, the glossolalia. Yeah, and they get into the whole glossolalia and, and all of that sort of thing. But the thing about that is, and this is very interesting, is it sometimes produces phenomena that is absolutely extraordinary, which certainly yeah, which just tells you that there is a lot of, of what the mind can do going on there. Right. And if if those kind of people can get people into limbic resonance to effect miracle cures, which does happen, yeah. um, what can they do if they're if they have very nefarious intentions? At least at least in a Pentecostal church, for all intents and purposes. Most of the time, there is a benevolent agenda. Mm -hmm. I mean, if they want to scare them to give them some money, so what? You know, mm -hmm. um, they're putting in their time and their talents, whatever. I mean, people pay money to go to a football game, to go to a rock concert, to what all that kind of stuff. You know, you go to church and you you get a different kind of of an experience, but you get an experience, right? Pentecostal churches, at least. Yeah. <laughs> and you get this experience, and you know, so why shouldn't you put $5 in the, in the plate when they're passing or 20 or <laughs> You know, I was always very generous because um, I appreciated what was happening. I, I understood it as, as an exchange. Yeah. So, you know, I don't, for a long time, I was pretty hostile about Christianity. I mean, when I first, came out and realized that it wasn't true. The God spell, the God spell was broken. Yeah. <laughs> the way it was presented wasn't true. I, you know, my feelings were hurt. So, yeah, of course. So, uh, you know, I was a little hostile, but as time has gone by and I, you know, learned more, worked with a lot more people. I mean, we 25 years we've been working with people and, and dealing with people and, and observing and watch, you know, watching what's going on, transpiring in the, in the global and the social stage. And I've come to the conclusion that of all the different things that people could be doing, the least harmful is Christianity. I mean, yeah. the least yeah. harmful. I mean, the new age thing is, is really just uh, fundamentalism uh, 2.0. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, but we got, we ran quite away from our undergrounders, but I think it's all related. Well, I mean, I, I want to ask you then about just to keep going because it's so fascinating. You sent me an article this morning that we have proof that they're trying to de, de, you know, detune or turn off the spiritual center in the brain. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's what. You know that's kind of what I got out of it because they can they can use uh, uh, electromagnetic waves or some kind of waves to uh, turn off earth parts of the brain that cause people to adhere to their faith or to believe in things, and it's um, it's pretty sad, but at the same time, I mean it's it's so discouraging to see what they're doing and what they're thinking about. And they, they even say they can separate uh, conservatives from their, you know, apparently wrong views. Well, you know, I'm sorry, but I'm a conservative. And if you read uh, Jonathan Haidt's book, and that's H-A-I-D-T, or hate or Haidt, I, I prefer Haidt, I think hate's kind of a word way to pronounce it. So. But he wrote for uh, The Righteous Mind. 
And he talks about the differences between the perspectives of, say, liberals and conservatives. And apparently conservatives have a far richer and more nuanced and more intelligent worldview. Than that's 100% accurate. Mm-hmm. So that's 100% accurate. I mean, I don't even actually know how anyone, because as you know, all three of us are old enough, even though Hunter's just a baby, 30. Um, we've all been through school and we've all been conditioned to be liberal and to be accepting and, you know, to have a pure heart and a, a soft heart or whatever you want to call it, compassion. Yeah, right. But then as you get older and wiser, at least some of us do, as my... As my, Monica's father says now, you know, Jay, common sense just ain't common anymore. Yeah. Right. But yeah. literally, as we get older and wiser and more experiential and experienced, and hopefully we've traveled and we've met different cultures and different peoples and different things, we realize that that is basically ideological clop trap for the most part. Like, obviously, you have to be compassionate as a human being. And that's the key of ascending, hopefully, into fourth density as a service to others candidate. But at the end of the day, you can't just be ignorant of what of what reality is. And I would say that, like, supremely leftist ideological, you know, whatever they are, satanic at this point, Luciferian, whatever we want to call them, they're just living in delusion, completely living in delusion because they don't want to take personal responsibility for what's true and what is it. Oh, they don't believe that there is any truth. I right. mean, everything is is totally relative. I mean, they took relativity to a, to a really bizarre place and level because, you know, and they're always talking about, you know, my truth, your truth, my reality. <laughs> and I mean, you know, excuse me, there is truth. There is forensic truth. There is mathematical yeah. truth. Yes. Um, and, you know, you, when you say my truth and your truth, you know, one person's truth could be uh, in alignment with how the universe sees itself. And the other person's truth could be completely orthogonal, you know. And I don't think people want to get into that kind of a, a disagreement with the universe because you're not going to survive it. Do you remember Wayne Dyer, the master of the new age? Yeah. And he was telling, he would always tell you that there was more than one truth. Your truth is not my truth. I remember reading that because when I first got together with Monica and I was doing a lot of uh, introspective work, a lot of, you know, self-help stuff. And I would read that and I was like, this is absolute nonsense. Like I literally took his book and threw it across the room. I'm like, this is nothing of the sort. So it's like you, you really do have to do enough work to take what's worthy and take and, and what isn't. And as you said in your books, and you've made a very, very accurate uh, portrayal. The majority of the new age is literally being mind controlled themselves. Yeah. Well, I think I think what they tried to tried to piggyback that on was the fact that every person has their own experience and has their own feelings about things. For example, right. uh, you know, you may say something to me that causes me to feel offended because of some experience I had in the past. It has nothing to do with you, you know, and then, you know, may trigger me to react in a certain way. And then, you know, when we finally sit down and discuss it, we find out that you didn't mean it the way I took it, you know, and we have to come to some, you know, meeting place. So what I think what they did was they piggybacked on this idea that everybody has their own experiences, right. and their own uh, perception of things. Which may or may not be accurate because if you offended me because I'm basing my reaction on something that happened to me way in the past that has nothing to do with you, it's not truth. It's it's my perception. It's not my truth. And so they they took this and just piggyback. And everybody, of course, you know, can experientially feel. But you know, yeah, I had uh, all of my own experiences, and I see the world a certain way, and da 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 da, and yeah, that's right. I have my truth, but that's not what it is. It's not my truth. And I'll give you an exact example. There was a girl um, I knew back in Florida, and she was uh, aspiring to be uh, a writer. And she was 
she wrote something and she gave it to me to read or edit. And it was full of malapropisms. <laughs> and, you know, words being used inappropriately. And when, you know, like I showed her this word and I said, well, what do you mean by this? Because that's not the right word. And she says, she said, well, you know, it's not the right word, right? And I said, yeah. And she said, well, then other people will know too, but that's the word I like. Oh and, <laughs> and, and I said, uh, what are you writing this for? Are you writing this for other people to read it? Well, yeah. <laughs> says, are you writing for other people to understand it and to come to some, you know, meeting place with you and between your mind and their mind? You know, and I said, well, that's not the way to do it. You need to find the commonly agreed upon definition of words use the appropriate word in the appropriate place so that, you know, the most, the majority of people will be able to read it and understand it. And then, you know, do that. Don't make it all about you, what you like, you know, but that was her truth. <clears throat> Laura, I wanted to ask you in regards to kind of like this leftism, find your own or be your own truth, whatever. Sometimes I wonder, so obviously if we fast forward that agenda, it would lead to wholesale destruction, I would think. Like if, if everything got accomplished that is going on right now, it would lead to wholesale destruction. So is that what is going to happen? Or are we in this like hero's journey story arc where this is overcoming like a struggle and then we have, I don't know if it's a revolution or somewhere where we have to defeat this and come over it, or is it something that is just going to lead to the destruction of this density. And then that plays out. And then that, you know, I think if you look at a timetable, you'd say like, well, if this continues to go on at this pace within 10 to 15 years, like the earth as we know it would be destroyed, you know, institutions, civilization, and all things would be destroyed. Or is this something that you think will overcome and use to come back better? I don't know. I don't think it can be fixed. That's the first thing. The second thing is it can't continue forever because so many people are feeling compressed, repressed, suppressed, um, depressed. <clears throat> so there's going to be, you know, a reaction. I mean, it's like Putin said, you know, if we push a string, a spring <clears throat> at a certain point, it's going to spring back. So <clears throat> hold on, I'm going to turn this stupid thing off. I don't know how I got turned on. I got to. Oh, I made it worse. <laughs> there's a little, there's a little heater under my desk, and it fell over, and it turned itself on. <laughs> when you're pumping out hot air, and I was like, "Oh God, it was them, Laura. It was them. They're trying to disturb the broadcast." <laughs> but um, yeah, the uh, teams have said a few times, not too many, but a few that we're heading toward a big cleansing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think when they use the word cleansing, um, it's it's not what we would consider to be a friendly term. No. And uh, they made one remark at one point, it says, well, nothing lasts forever. And thank God for that. Yeah, right. What's going on right now cannot last forever. And no. thank God that, but there's not too many ways that it can our rebalance itself because we're talking about individuals and ponderology will get into that because when pathocrats are in power for them staying in power is a matter of existential necessity because they know that if they are no longer in power once they are out of power that they are going to feel the repercussions of you know the anger of humanity or other people against them for what they have done so they will go to unbelievable extremes to stay in power. And we've seen it in, you know, in history. Um, I mean, look at what Hitler did at the end. You know, destroyed Germany himself, essentially, uh, because, you know, he, he declared that the Germans didn't deserve to live because they, they didn't win when he wanted them to. Um, and you're seeing this fear and it, it, it's not the kind of fear that we would understand. It's, 
you know, because when we're when we're afraid, we're afraid of you know something rational, and they're afraid of not being in power, and they are determined to do. I mean, the, this World Health Organization, this World Economic Forum, you know, and all the people that they've put into power in various places. These people are pretty frantic yeah. to, to keep keep their hand on the reins of power, and. Um, and if, when you see the blatant, I mean, there is no freedom in the U.S. anymore. No. I would say that, uh, I would say you, the U.S. at the very least is going to be destroyed. And, you know, I hate to say it, but I don't know. I mean, because. seems so. It doesn't see, I don't see how it can go any other way. I mean, it's either going to be destroyed by this mass immigration or migration of, of illegal aliens into the U.S. and there'll be a civil war or somehow people are going to, you know, get into a, it'll either be a civil war or a revolution. Um, yeah. and, and they are different things, but the thing is, I don't see it, uh, I don't see it surviving. And the other thing is that the amount of hatred that is directed against America from a lot, lot of other places all over the world and I would say that the common people in countries that are supposedly friendly with the U.S. or allies with the U.S., the common people don't see it necessarily the way their leaders do. I don't think the common French people necessarily uh, feel all that friendly toward Americans, and I don't think the Germans or the Italians or, uh, you know, I think that they, they see what Americans are like when they come to visit, and they they see a lot more than, than what we give them credit for. And that's just the countries that the U.S. hasn't destroyed or attacked. You know, think about the Iraqis, think about people in the Middle East, people in the, in the, uh, you know, what would you call it, the Vietnam, Thailand, uh, whatever, those areas where the U.S. has been dropping bombs uh, forever. And there's just a lot of people around around the world that, really hate the United States, although they may like Americans or may not, you know, it, it depends. They may like Americans individually, but they can see what the U.S. is doing. It is the big bully. And so the idea that there may be a nuclear war, uh, it's it's a real possibility, and uh, if it does, you know the U.S. is going to get nuked righteously. Yeah, I mean it's going to be. Uh, yeah, it um, it's not a pleasant picture, and I would say that a lot of those kinds of things now, whether that's going to happen, or whether going we're going to get bombarded by you know overhead explosions of comet fragments that are going to ablate the landscape, uh, which has happened multiple times in history, uh, periodically and even regularly. Uh, it's six of one half a trillion of the other. What the hell was that? Sounded like a gunshot. Did you hear that? Yeah, it sounded like a gunshot. Sounded like, yeah. Ready? Yes. What was it? I know. It, was it was an explosion. Yeah. I don't know. Oh, so, shit. It's crazy. All right. Close the blinds and go outside and see if you can see something. Maybe it was a bird hitting the window. Maybe there's a good bird laying on the side. It literally sounded like a sawed-off shotgun at last. Yeah, it just went like, yeah, on the speaker. That's what it sounded like. I mean, the window is just like that. Go see Did, it break? Did the window break? No. <clears throat> no, they're, they're super heavy windows. And That's crazy. Maybe that was a message from him, as you were saying. What Hopefully there's saying. no black boomerangs over the house or anything right Why now. Why were we talking about whether we're going to get a hit by a comet or a nuclear war? <laughs> <laughs> you manifested that. <laughs> well, I want to say something to what you were saying, though. So I agree 100%. I've traveled the world extensively in the last 10 years, and most foreign countries – like Americans individually based on who you are vibrationally. But yes, the idea of America as like the great usurper, you know, this, you know, ideological 
country that bombs everyone into the Stone Age that doesn't agree with their policies is 100% true. And I will also say that previous to my travels, when I was more, um, you know, red, white, blue, America, fuck yeah, you know, I was brainwashed into thinking that, you know, all these places like the French, the Frenchies, I have so many good friends and uh, French friends now, you know, were just bad people or just, you know, all the stereotypical bullshit that Americans have been brainwashed into thinking. And I've found now through my travels that it's all opposite. It's the, it's the opposite. It's literally the opposite. Yeah, and the thing is, is that uh, uh, what 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 to do? You know, that has to be up to every individual. But I would say that if anybody in the United States, uh, but it's hard because you know, I mean, I know how people feel. You know, they want to try to stay and fix it and defend it. Yeah. I mean, come on. I, I mean, genealogy is my hobby. I have so many ancestors who fought in the American Revolution uh, that, you know, I could join DAR 50 times uh, or on 50 different lines. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's a really hard call to make. Really hard call. Yeah. But getting out of the U.S. might be a good idea for the person that it's the right idea for. I mean, I think it's the right idea for everyone, but you know, not everybody unfortunately can afford it. I left the U.S. for ten months, and now I'm back. <laughs> but I'm close to me for me right now. I'm close enough to Mexico that it still justifies. But I, I mean, obviously, I'm in total agreement with you. It's just, it's most people don't know any better. You know, they they they've lived in one place their whole life. Mexico, some places in Central America, South America, some places. Um. You know, there are, there are different places where people can go. Hunter, do you agree that the U.S. is be, being programmed to be destroyed? I think so. One thing I've noticed, Laura, is, and I have only traveled to Mexico recently since the introduction of 5G and different, like, overwhelming frequency technology that's been introduced in the last couple of years, really since 2020, I guess, that you would say, like, the it seems to be in Russia up. It seems like there's a harmonic slash frequency control grid over the united states and when we go to mexico i don't notice that and i don't know if that's 5g i don't know if it's harp i don't know if it's something there but when i come when i leave the united states and then i come back i notice we always joke but we're always we always said we you know jay monica my girlfriend and i when we came back we said oh we feel like we're back in the matrix and it really felt like we came back into this frequency modulated control grid. And the people, even though people are just different in different countries, it seemed more of like a zombie state here in the US to where people in Mexico, obviously there's zombies everywhere, but they didn't have that same sensation, if that makes sense. Like when you interact with a person face to face. There, there's no spraying, there's no spraying in the skies, Laura, either. So it's Hunter's accurate. And then Hunter to you, also to add to your point, the food. In Mexico is literally ten times better. It's yeah, cleaner. It's like, it's funny because the other day I saw a comparison. Did you find anything? We're all, this, the, 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 no dead birds. Okay. So uh, they were just making themselves known that they yeah. they're listening to. There was uh, a comparison between two boxes of cereal: the one that's made in the EU and the one that's made in the US. And I don't know if any if y'all have seen this, but they're you know the one that's made in EU EU has like five ingredients, and the one made in the US has like fifty ingredients, most of them chemicals. And because well, there are a couple of positive things about the EU, but not enough to keep it going. I'm just but I, I'm pretty, <laughs> for some of the 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 early rules they made about you know uh, food and produce and you know purity of it and having clearly marked. Uh, uh, boxes or packages and so forth. So, you know, here, if you buy a box of cereal, even if it's the same name or brand that you get in the U.S., it's not going to be the same thing. It's not going to be full of poison. Um, here, you get plenty of fresh produce that is not sprayed with any of the, the chemicals that uh, spray on the produce in the U.S. because it's against the law. And they don't use, you know, like what, glyphosate, uh, it's against the law. 
and a lot of other things uh, that are just simply against the law. Or not, they, they don't use them. And you can get raw milk and you can get uh, cheeses made from raw milk and so forth because, you know, come on, France is the land of a thousand cheeses. Um, so there are places in the world where you can live a better life than you live in the U.S. I mean, even food-wise, there are, there are trade-offs. You know, I mean, taxes. all the food is contaminated, Laura, in the United States. All of it. Hunter and I talk about this all the time. There's nothing you cannot go to a you know five star, you know internationally famous restaurant and not be laden. Your food is laden in chemicals. It's impossible to eat in the United States without getting chemicals on your food. Almost everyone who lives healthy has to either buy from an organic farm that's like sustainable, close to them, and even that, right? I mean, how are they stopping from what's coming out of the sky? But you cannot buy your you cannot buy any organic or grass fed or wild caught uh, meats at Costco's or any place. They're all contaminated at this point. Yeah. Everything. Yeah, and that's that's what we love about where we are because we live in the countryside and we're surrounded by farms and fresh produce. And every you know every Thursday in our town is market day where all the local farmers bring their produce in to sell to all the local people. That's awesome. And there's. There's plenty of wild boar and deer around. I mean, you can buy venison and wild boar in the supermarkets. That's awesome. I, mean, I don't think you can get that really in the U.S. It's, a, it's actually illegal here to do to sell venison if it's not farm raised. So it can't be wild venison. It's illegal, at least in the United States, to do that. I wanted um, to ask Laura, because obviously Jay and I talk about health stuff a lot. What do you think the hyper-mentional nature of the engineering of food is doing it to us because I think you have glyphosate, which causes micro in the gut lining to give people leaky gut, which then affects their neurotransmitter signaling because of what's going on in their brain. So a lot of people are like, oh, glyphosate's bad just because it's bad because it causes health issues. But do you think there's something going, my suspicion is that there may be something going on with engineering people by affecting their neurotransmitter signaling through the disruption of their hormones and their gut microbiota and all these things. Do you think, obviously everything's like kind of layered. Do you think there's a hyper dimensional control mechanism behind food engineering to the human genome that's going on right now to humanity? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. And, I, and I'll tell you why, because I, I would say that a lot of these people who are responsible are coming up with these health rules and regulations and uh, vaccine schedules and people like Kellogg who, you know, who set up the whole thing to destroy, you know, people's health the and, the, and the food pyramid and the whole nine yards. It's got to be hyperdimensionally controlled in order to make human beings more controllable. And, right. one of the, you know, in one of the, or several sessions we had with the fees, we talked somewhat about this and we talked about the fact that, DNA is an antenna. Right. Every cell in your body has D has you know DNA and it's an antenna. Right. And depending on what DNA is active, you know, it determines what antenna is activated or being utilized. And um, for example, uh, the use of vegetable oils. Vegetable oils are very very bad. Horrible. Uh, Seed oils are contaminated. And um, and one of the one of the reasons is is that you know the the cellular uh, membrane that surrounds every single cell in your body is made out of oils, and animal oils produce membranes that are smooth and um, homogeneous. <clears throat> uh, vegetable oils produce little pieces of of almost like plastic that get agglomerated together to make these cell walls and they're spiky <coughs> and they're not the least bit conducive to interacting with the cellular environment including um brain chemicals and and uh, <coughs> whatever is going on so you can destroy your entire body by consuming a lot of vegetable oils. You know, I don't, we have olive oil, like for salads. Yeah. <clears throat> and um, sometimes we make mayonnaise with 
uh, grapeseed oil because it, it, it makes a nice mayonnaise. But uh, yeah, we make our own mayonnaise. Um, but uh, for the most part, you know, we we do nothing but animal fats, you know, beef fat. Duck fat's very big in France, you know, because there's, there's a big duck industry. I wish there was something like that in the U.S. God, I would never go back to the U.S. because I couldn't get any good food. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but, well, it's it's funny, too, because it affects the permeability of that cell membrane to allow nutrients in and out. And like you were saying, it makes it, like, very rigid and rough, whereas if you have uh, a cell membrane that's built on animal fats, it allows for the transport of all those nutrients into the cell. So, so and that, that right away, you know, is going to affect a lot of things, but what is even more important is the effect on the um, DNA and the damage that's being done to DNA by some of these chemicals. That's right. And I would say that a person's ability to uh, receive uh, cosmic transmissions, if you want to call them that, depends on the state of their DNA. 100%. That's your, that's your antenna. It's, it's a receiver, and, a sender and a receiver. So whatever DNA is, is activated in you, and, and it can vary from moment to moment, depending on what's going on in your body, uh, depends to a great extent on your food, probably on any kind of waves you're being subjected to, like 5G or you know, right. microwave radiation even harp radiation and so forth. So I think that there is there is an engineering going on. Well, I can take it one step deeper. Let's go deeper. So fat 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 acceptance. You know, now the glorifying of obesity. Now I know this for a fact that the more visceral body fat, well first off let's go even let's unpack this deeper. So visceral body fat is more inflammatory than clerisy. So you start thinking about how they're promoting fat acceptance, <laughs> obesity, insulin I, resistance. I have been for most of my life, but I don't overeat. I never do. I don't think you're fat. I mean, I'm talking about like what my mom was. My mom was 400 pounds. She was like morbidly obese. I think that fat people, um, they have more than just an eating problem uh sure a lot of them because to me fat is inflammation i mean right, right. exactly that's what i was going with so it, like it's a it's a condition it's a right a disease even um it is yeah and the more fat you get rid of when i lose weight i feel so much better because i get rid of inflammation but yes. it's very difficult for me because i have a specific mutation that makes it almost impossible um that which details of which are unnecessary um but uh i think that the glorification of fat is is extremely it's 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 terrible because look at look at what they've done they have right. made it so that what 60 to 70 percent of american people are overweight 70 so you're ready for this this is a new statistic this is insane 72% of men and women over the age of 40 in the United States are obese, not well, overweight, obese. And how did they get that way? They didn't exactly. get that way, you know, in, in, a, in any kind of natural way. I mean, they got that way because their food is poisoned. Yes, the air, people, water. The air, the water, the hormones that they put Everything. in their I, I would Everything. say the hormones they put in meat is probably one of the Everything. worst. Milk, just milk. And yeah, hormones and milk and meat. So now they've got this 70, 70 some percent population that's overweight, obese, and they're going to glorify it so that these people, you know, accept it. Yeah. You know, yeah. So people, you know, think, well, the people who are glorifying it, those are the people I'm going to follow. And they're all libtards and they're all, you know, so called. <laughs> So I'm going to be a little tired and woke too, you know, I mean, I mean, well, I am a fat person, but I can still, still tell you that I am very glad that my girls are not, you know, and I wasn't when I was young. Right. right? So right. I, I don't think. But, but, yeah, you, but Laura, you still, but, but here's the difference. And, and again, I'm not defending you. I'm just saying the difference between you and, the, you know, Sam and Sally 
you know, Smith and Topeka, Kansas, who are both obese and not even aware of it, is that it's like you just said, they, they don't even know what's being done to them. They're just living their life. They could be living on a farm. And, it, you know, it's like Hunter, like Dr. Anthony J said, and, and Laura, you've been saying it too, with microplastics in the cellular walls, there's no possibility they could even lose the fat. No. Like they could exercise all day long and starve themselves and their body will still not excrete these chemicals that have permeated the cell walls. That prevent, it, it literally prevents digestion. It prevents excretion. I mean, it's incredible what these people are dealing with. Well, I can only say for myself is that, you know, I get blood tests regularly. I just had a doctor poking around in my inner, just looking at everything. She says, God, it all looks so good. You there know? you go. So, even in spite of in spite of carrying the extra weight, you know, I am extremely, extremely healthy. But I often wonder, and I've, I asked the C's about it, and they told me that in my particular case, I needed to carry it because I needed it to carry the energy that I transduce. Right. And there are instances of rare individuals. This is not, this is not something that should be common in a society who do carry extra weight for that reason, because they carry extra energy. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, for example, you know, I, I think I even mentioned it before, you know, people, great mediums like Eusepia Palladino could lose 15 pounds in a session, you know, and that, that's not a small amount. And she was a, a large woman. She was, uh, you know, she was not like grotesque. It wasn't mm -hmm. like 400 pounds or anything like that, but she right. was a large woman, probably, you know, 230 pounds or something like that, probably tall. So there, and there are even, if you look at the, at the archeological record and you see these models of these, you know, like the Venus of Willendorf, you know, these, mm -hmm. these actually obscenely obese uh, female figures that, um, they think were like cult figures and maybe they were, maybe they were like the woman who was the seer for the group. And she was carrying that weight because she needed to for her job, you mm -hmm. know, her, her job as the seer, as the, as the, as the psychic uh, point of contact for that group. But for the most part, you know, the people then simply were not obese. I mean, their diet didn't permit it. Their uh, activity didn't permit it. Um, but obesity, obesity, though, I don't mean to cut you off or interrupt you, but obesity is a modern deal, right? Like this is, it depends. I mean, it's, it, but is it due to more affluence and just being people having access to, you know, on-demand instant gratification food and stuff? Peter Paul Rubens. I mean, he, he painted these, you know, really, really plush women. I, I, I'm a Rubens type, you know, so <clears throat> I really like him. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, but it's not, it's not something for young, young women. Young women who are in a reproductive age should not be obese. Right. Uh, and that's the and, and by the way, that's commonality now. I mean, again, you can go to any mall, any store that 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 you know offers clothing, and everything is now designed around covering up center adiposity. It's incredible. It, it, it it's absolutely insane. You know, there's a lot of people out there. Hunter, you've seen them that you know, they take they analyze videography or video uh, from the 70s and 80s of like large scale places like beaches all across the world. And they look at the, you know, the anthropomorphy of the people versus today, and it's insane. There was very few people, regardless of age, that were considered obese. I mean, it oh, just, it, it, it's, it's, this is all modern industrial technological expansion and, and, and clearly a hyperdimensional, uh, you know, overt attack to the human genome. There's no question. They're making people more passive. They're making people more inflamed. Obviously, they're taking the testosterone out of men. There may, may be another uh, factor that's playing into this, but I wonder, because, you know, we're due for an ice age. And, you know, I even wonder if uh, there's, you know, there's like some kind of 
signal that the DNA is picking up. To start holding on to weight. To, to start holding on to weight for, you know, a period of, oh. a long period of starvation. And I have oh. to tell you that I always, you know, when my children were little, I always wanted them to be a little on the plump side in case they got sick. Because a baby can lose a lot of weight very fast when they're sick. Yeah. I, I, you know, I didn't want them to be, you know, like super skinny. But think about what we went through in the 70s. Well, you didn't go through it because you were too, you're too young. But Hunter, I did. Hunter did. Twiggy. <laughs> think of Twiggy. And how yep. they started promoting this, this Twiggy. Uh, childlike physical appearance. And that was that was a com a complete mind job. What they were yeah, doing, yeah, yeah. and then how many models? That's what, yeah, and that's still being promoted today. You know, and and now the cocaine the cocaine diet, as they call it. <clears throat> and so then they went the other way, where you know people started objecting to it because some of these models were dying of of uh, uh, malnutrition, yeah. food disorders, eating disorders, and. So then they started going the other way. And now what they're doing with this promotion of fatness, I have no freaking idea. It's scary stuff. It's freaking obscene. Well, like the picture, I mean, I mean, you know, the, we, Hunter and I are in a telegram group with a bunch of guys and it, we're all kind of like ex jocks. And we talk about what they're doing right now with women's basketball. So it goes from, it goes from, um, how do I say it? It goes from like obesity, you know, putting that, you know, and I don't know who the woman is, but that, you know, they, they had that Nike model. She's a really fat black chick and who's got belly rolls like hanging over, you know, her body and she's just obscenely <laughs> awake. No, I mean, we're being honest here. And, and they have her in like a yoga, you know, spandex and they promoted it everywhere. Hunter, you know which one I'm talking about. It was on every Nike commercial. It was all over the world. It was on Madison Square Garden billboards. It was everywhere. It was like, just do it. You know, like it's okay. You can be like this too. And 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 and, and you know, from a, a larger socioeconomic context and health context, as you know, it's not okay because that is not health. It's the furthest thing from it. And 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 it's proven that people like that don't live as long. It's just the way it is. So no, here's here's my question, Laura. I've been like really low body fat before. And I honestly, like when I'm like really, really low body fat and I don't feel, I guess like spiritually attuned would be the word because you're almost like in a starvation state. So you're just kind of like in like survival mode, you know? But um, I think there's the other side too, where you can have too much body fat and too much inflammation. I, think I wonder, is, is all of this just a signal for people to not be the healthiest version, because we can all agree that like, whatever it is, if it's like the cocaine model versus like the, the chick from Nike that was like 400 pounds and a yoga studio, is it just to disconnect people from their true essence of like what a human should be so that they're spiritually tapped in wow. so wow. that they feel good about themselves so that they can actually receive those cosmic downloads? I, th I think what they've done at least from the human side, is they've taken all these different marginalized groups, you know, gay gay people and fat people and so on. Trans, yeah. Diversity, equity, and inclusion. Well, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion really should be spelled D-I-E because they're all going to die. Because what That's, they're doing for themselves, for right, their bodies, right. is, I mean, whether they're becoming morbidly obese or whether they're whacking off their peepees or their breasts or are taking, you know, sex hormones from the opposite sex to which they were born, they're destroying their bodies. Meanwhile, 72% of the population of the United States is probably obese, if not morbidly obese. Incredible. Um, from all the chemicals that are in the food, from the hormones. I mean, our years ago, 25 years ago, I read where children uh, down in the, in the Caribbean islands were... Uh, girls were getting their periods at the age of six or seven because of the hormones in the chicken that they were eating. And <clears throat> so they're, what they've done is absolutely freaking criminal, but it's not any more criminal than what they did with COVID, which was a complete scam and, right. and poisoning. And, and of course, this guy that uh, this 
there's this doctor who's talking about the fact that the, the spike protein is designed to aid in a bad uh, mind control or you know changing people's personalities, changing things in their brains. And we know that's possible because if you look at toxoplasmosis, uh, toxoplasmosis can can turn a mouse into a you know something that you know seeks out the cat to get eaten, and there there are all kinds of parasites that people can get that affect the brain and, and affect the way they think and affect their personality. So I think it's yeah I think it's all part of a human decimation program directed from hyperdimensional beings, fourth density, STS, because they want to reduce the human population to something like, you know, 19 million or something like that. And, and, and they are going to supposedly rule the human population through their appointed agents like Bill Gates and uh, <clears throat> Anthony Fauci and all these other, you know, crazy. What what's that Canadian guy? Uh, <clears throat> Trudeau. Trudeau. Yeah. Yeah, and they're gonna. And I don't think those people even realize that they're going to be among the first that are going to be gotten rid of. I know, right? Is it? By the way, do you think that you know all the rumors of a Trudeau being Fidel Castro's illegitimate son? Is it? Do you think it's true? Probably not. You know, I mean, it's. It's possible. I'm not going to exclude it as a possibility, but he looks what he looks like his father. Doesn't look like Phil. Yeah. So. Do you think so? That's actually a good point, Jay. I just thought about. Do you think we've seen this with like Michelle Obama that she was never really pregnant? There's a lot of these other like famous politicians and celebrities that I think they Michelle don't really have the man. Well, there's no question that's yeah. true. By the way, I have I have insiders. That's not for this We're show. We talk off air. I I know that for a fact. No. Yeah. So uh, why, so it, I want to you die, think they would, wouldn't they find psychopaths that could actually have real children? Or is that like the big joke that it's like, Hey, we're going to put these people in power and they're also not going to be who they say they are. And then we're going to get like babies from other people and call them their kids or everything. It just um, seems like one big focus. Now, you know, you'll notice in polarology, you'll talk about the fact that they don't want, you know, the full blown psychopaths to be in the public eye because they, they can't control them. Mm -hmm. You see, and they and they they have learned that they make things really bad with the public, right? Um, so they get people who have other kinds of pathological deviancies and put them in the in the positions where they're publicly visible. And you know, the real hardcore psychopaths are the ones that are behind the scenes doing this. You know, the super super dirty stuff. So I would say all the people who are surrounding people like uh, Joe Biden are probably the, the real psychopaths. People like Karl Rove and Pompeo and the well, 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 that's actually that's actually an interesting question for you, and it goes into the Undergrounders articles that you sent us again from the Tibet stories of how that guy, whatever his name was, uh, you know, is talking about how there's quote unquote hyperdimensionals. Well, I like to think of you know all these shows that they showed us on in, in, in Hollywood in the last thirty years about how there's immortals, right? There was Highlander. They're always kind of giving us you know insider tips that there are beings walking amongst us that truly do live forever. You know the alchemists, however you want to call them, but at least eight hundred years, right? And and, and and perhaps and perhaps longer, you know, again from the Hollywood shows. But do you, do you think there are dark magicians dark alchemical masters that are you know because obviously we know about the psychic projectors that the seas have told us that are in the, in the under in the undergrounders or the inner earth or wherever they are the hyperdimensional beings and some of them are in service to others and some of them are service to self but do you think that we have this group of good guys and bad guys that are again immortals walking amongst us <clears throat> Well, the, the bad guy type immortals, in order to get to be immortal on the bad guy pathway, you have to become very contractile. Right. And a very contractile individual doesn't generally interact much with anything or anybody. They are only concerned with consumption. You know, eating. More, even more contractile. So I don't think we have to worry about too much of them 
uh, that sort, you know, hyperdimensional ones walking amongst us. But there are certainly human uh, people who believe and and practice satanic uh, arts and so forth, and they are working very hard to become one of these higher dimensional evil beings so that they can just, you know, become totally lazy and contractile and absorb food from all of their feeding tubes. Uh, and some of them are pretty evil as far as I can tell. And I've encountered a few low-level ones. Uh, you know, I, I've, I wrote about them in the way. Yeah, we know who they are. <laughs> uh, but like I said, I don't think the really high-level ones get out and interact much. They send all their, you know, all of their feeding tube people to get out there and, and hook people up and then they feed from them and then they feed from them. So it becomes like a, a relay of, of loosh. Do you, well, do you think in this, like, I know we're speculating here. This, this is when the seas would rein us in and say, come back. But when they have these really dark ceremonial practices, when they're summoning these, you know, reptilian, demonic, whatever these entities are that we've all heard stories about, is that when one of them, like a you know a master desolate one, as you would call it in the books, would would come and make themselves appear? Is that because you you've heard stories of so many people talking about? Yeah, that's when they show up. It's it's really possible uh, that they might appear briefly, serve to you know give their you know their followers or whatever some kind of a titillation or thrill and and make them feel like they've been. Uh, <clears throat> blessed with an appearance, and but they certainly don't do much as far as I've been able to tell. They're, uh, like I said, they're very contractile. Um, as for positive ones, uh, you have to remember the rules that they have to live by, you know, which is to, you know, non interference unless truly asked. And, you know, I mean, the thieves have said, you know, what is, I, I asked them, what, is, what does it mean to be 40 SDO? or just SDO, you know, without any, you know, parameters on it. And this is one who gives all to those who ask. Now, that sounds like a really simple formula, but when you think about it, it's really not so simple. I mean, how much, how, what, what person is able to really give all and what kind of person is able to really ask? Most people manipulate, they demand, they, feel entitled to, you know, all kinds of emotions are behind any kind of request. Right. <clears throat> and it's like, you know, I even asked the seeds, you know, I, you know, how come, how come I got a connection with you guys? And I said, because you asked. Right. Exactly. And, you came from a pure heart. And, and it was, you know, I did an awful lot of work before I got to the point where I knew that I knew where I couldn't do it on my own because it simply wasn't available. There was stuff that simply wasn't available. Did you have a husband that was literally siphoning every bit yeah. of energy from you? Yeah. My ex wife, I mean, my, my current wife had this same thing happen to her. And I'm sure that my ex was siphoning from me and I didn't know. Well, just it's crazy how it works. Yeah, it is. And it's just kind of like the way it is. And there's people that live all their lives with somebody who's siphoning energy off of them. Think about that. And they, uh, you know, so. Yeah, we know we we have experiences with that. So, <clears throat> well, well, let me ask you about that. Can can a person ascend at the realm border crossing? If that's how we want to refer it, as a service to others, you know, candidate, if they're in a relationship with an absolute soul sucking vampiric being, even if they do everything else right, can that person still make it out? If they do everything else right that would probably imply that they are aware that they are with someone who is doing that. And for their own reasons, they have chosen not to end the relationship and they probably will right. be right. Because, you know, you, you can, uh, you can take care of some kinds of situations like that, but there's, there, there are other situations where if you aren't aware, mm -hmm. if you don't know that the person you're with, is siphoning your energy away from you, uh, then there's nothing you can do. If you are aware, you can protect yourself. So, <clears throat> anybody. Well, 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 
a question for you around that. And this goes to like Gary Zukov. And I don't know what Gary side Gary Zukov's on, but his newest book, which was from 2022 Hunter, and, and I, I can't even remember the name of it. It's over in my bookcase. I'm not going to look for it because I want to keep the spirit of this conversation. But he says that you can't truly spiritually evolve if you are in a relationship with a, with a normie, a sheeple, a person that's not aware, and you are aware, because ultimately the energy comes back to the mean. So what do you what do you say about that? Because I, I agree with what you just said, but what do you think about that? I agree because if you're aware, if you know, and you mm -hmm. are staying in the situation for your own reasons, um, <clears throat> I think you'll be fine. So what would be, I guess, for the audience, what would be the, the other reasons, like for, to take care of children, to provide? For children, uh, you know, for, for simple compassion, because let's say if you're with an individual who has to feed <clears throat> to survive, say, an organic portal type, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that our attitude towards such individuals it should be that of compassion i mean just the same way we're compassionate towards dogs and cats um and other creatures so you know if you're in a situation where you know for whatever reason and everybody's reasons would have to be you know different uh, or would necessarily be different um as long as you are aware and as long as you do not allow the feeding but the problem there is if you don't allow the feeding, how does they how do they eat? Then that other person is likely to extract themselves from your environment anyway. That's a good point. So is that what happened with your with your ex? <clears throat> no, I mean I I extracted myself from the environment. You know, I knew I knew I was going to die if I didn't. Right. That's kind of the way my ex. I mean, my, Monica was too with her ex. It was like she just got to a point where she was like, I don't care. I was, There's well, I was, I was physically dying. Yeah. Yeah. So, you were physically dying. Yeah. So, I mean, it just, I, and I knew I needed to be able to raise my children. And if I wanted to raise my children, you know, all of my ideas about staying in the marriage for the sake of the children, you know, just had to fly out the window because I realized I wouldn't be there to take care of them and they would be there subject to, you know, his very strange ideas and, and, way of being that and I would so, hurt them. So just having that mindset that this is a fascinating discussion. So just having that mindset, because we all have been brainwashed, in my opinion, that you stay in marriages for the sake of the children. I know that it's religion, it's Christianity, it's Catholicism, it's so many. Is that a hyperdimensional control construct that they created? Uh not necessarily. Once again, there's no simple answer. Yeah. Uh, not necessarily because, the, but the problem is, is that marriage has become something different from what it was in former times. And it has, it comes about in different ways than it did in former times. And for different reasons, you know, people fall in lust and they have this, this whole programming that causes them to <clears throat> marry somebody for certain reasons. Right. And uh, those reasons aren't enough to sustain a relationship much past, you know, five to seven years, usually. Right. And I mean, it's like, you know, there were, there was, I watched a talk given by a, a divorce lawyer. And he said from the statistics on divorce, <clears throat> which is well over 50% of all marriages end in divorce. Right. And he wouldn't get married. You know, he just, he just, you know, just simply wouldn't. But, Marriages should be monogamous and they should be long lasting. That is the condition in which the greatest spiritual growth that's right can take place. So marrying for the right reasons to the right person is a very important thing and it's not so easy to find out, you know. Um in in some cultures they have people who pair people because they know things about them objectively that the two individuals may not know themselves. So they put them together and it turns out to be, you know, a good, a good fit. 
usually when people are allowed to choose on their own, <laughs> it's usually, you know, over 50% divorce rate. Well, the other question around that though is, so I'm, I'm, I, what we see completely eye to eye on this. The other question about that is, is of the people that are staying together, how many of them are actually cheating on each other? Well, yeah, and that's another bad thing because you know when you have sex with somebody, you, you, it, it changes your frequency. It, it, you know, can change the, very, uh, what do you call it, the, the transmission and receivership capability of some of your DNA. Uh, changes your energy field. Uh, and that's for both partners, and right. but you can also pass attachments that way. So, yeah, I mean, you know, that's <clears throat> that's just reality. So then, you, so you have an affair, and then you come back to your partner, and you've got this messed up energy and this messed up DNA and everything, and then you have sex with your partner, and then you pass it right. on to your partner, you know, male or female, or whatever. And it's you know, so there are very, very good reasons. For monogamy that are yeah. spiritual or or energy related, and there's also very very good reasons for people to abstain from sex until they are in a monogamous relationship. Yeah. You know? So, Laura, <clears throat> I wanted to ask you this because I just thought of it. Do you think because we've talked about the orgasm a little bit, which we could probably go into deeper detail? Do you think a child that is conceived through orgasm of both parties at the moment of conception has any sort of like different DNA transcription or manifestation when they're born versus one that is not? And that there's like a there's a something to the idea that when two people are in a monogamous relationship, they're in love with each other and they have an orgasm when the child is formed, that that child will now either have a different DNA expression that allows them to be more spiritual, whatever that would mean, uh, versus two people that are not, that are once cheating on the other or whatever, and then they're born out of that. And then there's like this trauma that's passed down generationally to them. I like it. <laughs> yeah. Like you said, yeah, all po all possibilities. I, yeah. I, I think about that. Of it would, people. It would, it would make sense. Well, in the Barbara Marciniak books, which the C's have said are somewhat accurate, they talk about managing the, the, the one of the biggest jobs of a human is to manage their energy field. And I think having the same thing and casting yeah. is the same thing. And right. Right. Alchemists say the same thing, you know, so it's all, uh, you know, managing your energy uh, is very important. Do you, do you think it's the most important thing? <clears throat> the most important thing. As a human on in third density, uh, I guess it would depend on what your objective was. If your objective is to manage your energy in order to serve others, right? Probably highly, highly important. Uh, if you're managing your energy because you're selfish and you have selfish goals and aims, and I think it's probably not so good a thing. Mm -hmm. Good point. It's the opposite. If you're if you're managing energy to harvest a dream from, probably not a good idea. But managing your energy is is extremely extremely important because you can't think, you can't see, you can't uh, you can't perceive at higher levels. You can't do a, a whole host of things if you don't have the energy of awareness, and that's what right. Pat Moore calls it. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> You know, I'm trying to think if there was a specific term that Gurdjieff gave to her, and I don't think there especially was. He was taught, he he was concerned more about the difference between essence and being. Right. You know, so, um, yeah. If you have essence, but you don't have being, then, you know, it's it's wasted. And if you have too much being and not enough essence, then, you know, then you can't do anything. You know, being... For him, it was being able to do, to, to actually be able to do, <clears throat> because people think that they are able to do and they're not. Mm. They're, they, you know, they're completely helpless. They can't really do anything because they can't see uh, accurately. They can't see objectively. Um, they don't have the energy. 
uh, they don't have the knowledge. Knowledge is really, really a big one because, you know, it's like Gurdjieff talks about external considering being, you know, super, super important. And that's having a knowledge of yourself, you know, a really accurate, ruthless knowledge of yourself and your, your failings and your strengths and all of the things that, you know, are going on with you and knowledge of other people so that, you know, you can make your life and their life easier. Gurdjieff, for example, you know, he had a, he had a wife that he was married to for whatever reason, and he wasn't faithful to her. I don't think he was a very good example, but then he was a product of his culture too. Right. Uh, he had affairs with other women. Uh, and then of course, you know, he didn't, you know, he ended up having that accident that, you know, injured his brain and, you know, kind of faded away and, and his work got messed up because, and I think, I think his ego was just a little bit, a little bit too big. I love Gurdjieff, but I think, I think he, I think his ego was too big and he, he bit off way more than he could chew. Um, so yeah, energy conservation is important and it's important for another reason. You don't want your energy feeding STS. Exactly. exactly. I mean, as simple as that. that. That's why I asked you that because in my personal experience, in the last five years, so I can almost cry just thinking about this. Like I have become so cognizant of how I act based on what happens to me, right? And I can always choose to respond out of love, which takes thought, it takes emotional control, it takes responsibility, great responsibility, or I can react, which is again, you know, I go back to the you know vibrational analysis field over here, and it's like eighty percent of humanity just reacts. Yeah. Road rage. Somebody cut me off. Fuck them. I'm going to get them. Right. We've all been there. But once you get to some place where you can actually look back at the moment it happens and be like, okay, I don't have to jump into a rage. I don't have to react. I don't have to emote. I don't have to just be a nut job. You're not being fed off of. You can also practice saying I'm sorry and meaning it sincerely a lot. That's true too. I mean, you, you should try to find a way to, you know, to find out if you can say I'm sorry. And mean it. At least once a day, if not more often, and be sincere about it. And and then also have a talk with yourself about not putting yourself in the position where you have to say I'm sorry every day. So. Well, I think a lot of times men, especially, this is a really good point that you just made, because I think men, especially early in relationships with women or whoever your significant other is, whoever's the feminine and the masculine, they want to apologize for everything to make things right in the relationship. And it's an absolute, absolute wrong thing to do, because if you do that every single time for your wife or for your husband or whatever, whoever's the masculine, whoever's the feminine, and I know there's a combination of it, but if you do that every single time, you disable the other person from taking responsibility. Well, it depends on who really needs to say they're sorry. I mean, each case is individual. Sometimes you really need to say it, and sometimes you need to say, you know, I'm sorry you felt that way about what I said or what I did. That's a great point. I didn't mean it the way you took it, you know, but I'm, you know, I'm, I'm me too. You know, I'm a human being too. And I, and I, you know, I didn't, I didn't mean it that way. And, and, I, and any, any normal person would have taken it the way I meant it. Don't, don't oh, but I mean, you're, no, no, but, but you're making a fascinatingly amazing point here because I, Hunter, you know this from just, you know, your relationships too. Like we really want to, as uh, I'll just say it as this, as, as, as a, as a, as a masculine energized man, we want, whether it's brainwashing and hyperdimensional control construct, either or it doesn't matter. We want to fall on the sword and make things right. And it's not always the right thing to do by falling on the sword, regardless of who's at fault. It's what you just said. It's, it's having the awareness to have a conversation or to communicate effectively where both adults can come to a place of like looking at what really happened and examining 
you know, their thoughts and their feelings and going to it from there. Whereas I'm telling you, I see it so often, even in my own personal relationships in my life, where I've just been like, you know what, I'm a stronger person. I'm going to fix this. And I'm not now allowing my spouse or my significant other, or even if it's a child, you know, a, 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 or a brother or sibling or whatever, you're not allowing that to be conducive to effective communication. Communication is the huge, huge key to any relationship. I mean, talk, talk, talk. I mean, this is my husband. He talk, 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 talk. He's always telling me because I tend to, you know, go in a shell. Yeah, uh, you're Monica. You're Monica. Yeah, you're my wife. I, I, I lock up and I, I, you know, well, if you don't know, I can get the time. <laughs> It's crazy. I can't see you being that way, but I mean, I, I mean, I can, but I, you know, obviously learning from you and stuff, it's, it's weird, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's the thing though. And I, and I really do think, and this is just my opinion again, but I really think that women are also trained from an early age to do that. Yeah. Yeah. It's true. And, you know, so me to be able to wear my, sincere complaints even if i know that they're um they may be childish they may be um petty you know believe it or not i can i can i can feel a little petty sometimes and uh, but if i can tell him about it and then he can and we can talk about it then it kind of relieves it and it stops affecting me in that way um <clears throat> But yeah, and, and we, we kind of made a rule at the beginning of our relationship that we would always be honest with each other. And I mean, you can be honest and be loving, you know, I mean, like he, he could put his arm around me and say, you know, you know, I love you, but uh, do you really want to do that? Do you really want to do that? You know, and I, I you know, I mean, it, it came in important at a couple of times because there were several times back in uh, 99, 2000, 2001, when I just wanted to just shut down the website, not publish any more of the seized material and just, you know, uh, throw in the towel and go home. And I mean, it even comes through in some of the sessions because, you know, I didn't understand in the beginning that I was going to become under so much attack. And I got really upset after one of these episodes, you know, and I just jumped up from my desk and went into my bedroom and curled up in the bed and I just, laid there and thought, you know, I'm, you know, the, the, the kind of hours I put into this, the years I've put into this, and da, 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 and I mean, all through my head, you know, and then people accuse me of crap like that, and they say those nasty, mean things, and then they do blah, 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 that sort of thing, and, you know, I'm going to just go in there, and I'm going to delete the website, and with all of them. <laughs> I'm going to delete it, I'm going to take my ball and go home and delete the website. Yeah, and so, and so he comes in and he says, you know, what's what's going on? And so, finally, I got up enough nerve to say all of that. And so he puts his arms around me and he says, well, what about all of the people, you know, who you have helped? You no, know, and he starts talking to me and I explain, you know, da da da. So, I didn't delete the website, but that's the kind of thing. You know, he, and he could tell me, he says, you know, you, you feel this way because, you know, you, you've done so much and so on and you, and you feel like, you know, you're, you're thwarted, you're hurt, whatever, but you can't have those kinds of feelings when you're doing this kind of thing. You can't allow that to come into play because, you know, you're doing something that's bigger than you as a human being are, you know, and that was where the, you know, the honesty comes in that, you know, yeah, you're being childish and petty without exactly saying it that way, but, you know, it comes across, you know, you have to be bigger than this. And uh, so, yeah, communication and honesty, and you, and you can keep on. And, you know, we had a conversation at that time. He said, he says, what if, he says, We're, from your publishing, you know, you've got me, he says, and, you've, and, and you're putting all of this material out, you're writing, I was writing the wave at the time. And he says, what if there aren't any others? And I sat there, and I'll never forget it. I, you know, I sat there, and I thought about it. And then I said, well, I guess I should do it anyway, because the universe deserves it. 
somebody needs to talk about these things and point these things out just for the sake of it being the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do. The universe deserves it. It would be a shame for the universe to end if nobody in the universe was telling the truth. I mean, honestly, we would be podcast right now, Hunter, if she didn't do it. Yeah, well, I was going to say, thank God you did. And I wanted to ask you, because this is something, you know, Jay's dealt with for many years, but it's increasing now because of us talking about this very stuff right here. Oh, imagine How what it's going to be like in six weeks, bro. I know. Well, I wanted to ask you, Laura, is just kind of selfish advice for ourselves, but how have you through the years dealt with attacks from people and entities and organizations? Um, because like you said, it's obviously very tough and that's one thing Jane and I have dealt with, but it seems to be now more on the forefront, I guess, just because what we talk about is kind of increasing in popular consciousness. But how have you dealt with that and kind of kept pushing forward? Because I've felt kind of the same way at some points. Like, is it really worth trying to tell people you know, our information is really worth trying to teach people or write to people or make videos for people because it just seems like to fall on deaf ears and not only to fall on deaf ears, but then you get attacked by people that are, you know, criticizing what you're saying. So how have you dealt with that through the years to kind of make it through to the other side? It hasn't been easy. I have experienced a lot of physical, um, physical reactions to being attacked, you know, illness. Um, sometimes I have even had what clearly, and, and everybody around me knows that it was clearly that there was some force that was unleashed against me that caused me an injury that then took uh, a long time to recover from. And, you know, one, one particular one I fell and I didn't break my kneecap, but the meniscus, you know, the cartilage under the knee broke into three pieces. Shortly after that, because, you know, I kept walking around on the knee because, you know, a messed up knee is not going to stop me. And then I got into another situation where, you know, and I could actually physically feel a force pushed me. And, and, I, and I fell, and because the knee was already injured, I fell in such a way that I tore my hamstring. On, on the back of the same leg. And then of course, you know, you get messed up with messed up diagnoses from doctors who aren't paying attention to what's going on. I suffered from that thing six months, six months. It was just unbelievable. But, and then there was the broken tailbone and then there was, you know, uh, this, that, and the other thing, you know, physical problems, issues and so forth. So, so that's usually the way I, Really? And, you know, it, it, it gets internalized. And so I've gotten better at being more aware because, you know, you have to be really aware. You'll be very careful when you're doing something. And I've had a great support system. If there's anything that will get you through it is having a support system. You having people around you, a group around you that supports you, that can talk to you, that can take care of you that can help you. Um, I mean, I have had the most incredible support system or any human being on this planet. I swear it's, it's without, without compare. I mean, in terms of love and care and, and you know, the devotion of the kids to me and my, my kids' partners and, um, you know, they just, they just take wonderful care of me. So that isn't I, that, isn't so that divine reciprocity in action? because of all the things that you've done. I mean, look at the people, the audience you've attracted. I mean, again, it's like attracts like, I mean, I'm not, you know, saying that you are one an amazing mom because clearly you were and are based on just these broadcasts alone, but isn't that just divine reciprocity in action? Well, I, I hope so. I hope, you know, every once in a while, I think, you know, I must've done something good because, you know, God has blessed me with, you know, the most wonderful husband in the world and the most wonderful kids in the world and the kids' partners, and, you know, the friends, and, you know, people in our groups, you know, who support and take care of me. So, you know, I don't, that's, that's what's gotten me through it, is, is that, you know, my network, my, uh, my people, um, because, you know, I am the kind of person who internalizes these, these painful things, and I, 
you know, I mean, there there have been times when I've been so depressed that, you know, I could hardly get out of bed for days on end. It, it hasn't been easy. It has not been easy. So if anything, you need to be with a support system. And for us, we all live in the same house together, mostly. We have several houses around the world that have groups living in them. But, you know, in our particular group, we have a, a big house or a, a big group, and it's all part of the support system. And, you know, it's like tribal living. And, and yeah. I think people should live in tribes. You know, there should be several couples. There should be old people. There should be young people. There should be some singles. There should be, you know, a, a mix of people with different skills and abilities and all live together and support each other. And it's not like a commune, not anything like that. It's like, it's just like a big family. You know, yeah. well, a real family. You sit down at the table and you have dinner together. You talk about things. Uh, you all work together. You know, we, 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 we all are involved in the same work and the same uh, goals and same objectives. And we, um, we support each other. We watch each other's back. We take care of each other when we're sick. I mean, one of our one of our beloved members, you know, passed away last October, and he was with us for 14 years. And for all of those 14 years, he battled cancer, and we made sure that he had the most optimal life anybody could possibly have under those conditions. And he was happy for those 14 years. So, you know, that's the kind of and, and you care for each other. Or, you know, it's kind of like, it's bigger than a marriage. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's the way we were designed before whatever, before the hyperdimensional, if that's what we want to call it, control structure took over our modern day living, you know, because we were, you know, I, well, that, it, 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 it begs the question, are the aboriginals and the Amazonian lost tribes and whoever is still living on this planet without the uh, interruption of modern technology and society and whatever this is, industrialized living, are they closer and better off than us? Maybe in, in, in some ways. Well, are they, aren't they probably all telepathic? Um, maybe they are. Um, I don't, you know, I think that we've been given brain for reason, yeah, just like uh, Fred Hoyle said, you know, he doesn't see any evolutionary advantage to being able to do mathematics. But <laughs> some people, are, you know, people in the Amazonian rainforest, some of them I don't, th I think can't can't count any higher than three because they can't engage with that concept. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think mathematics is useful, and I think philosophy is useful, and I think history is useful, and I think. Uh, you know, interpersonal relations are useful and, and, and sewing and genealogy. I mean, all, you know, there's so many benefits to, you know, culture. And why can't we have it in such a way that it's, that it's beautiful and, and not overruled by, you know, the, the horrific pathology that runs our world today? Well, so it's a, so, so Hunter sent me this question this morning and it's a perfect segue and it's, is there a world in which we live in harmony with technology in a service to others manner? I think we could. And, you know, I had a dream about it one night and I'm pretty sure it was the seas talking to me directly because it was like, you know, I had the voice because when the seas talk to me directly, I have a voice and it usually happens when I'm sleeping. You know, I mean, I'm not one of those people that does trances or any nonsense like that. But I woke up and it was stated very clearly, any technology that uh, does not require at least 51% human input is, is entropic. So, you know, technology is a good thing. I mean, I love my washing machine and my dryer. I love my dishwasher, you know, um, but you know, I have to interact with them in order for them to work. And the same thing with like tractors and plows and, and other things, you know, that it takes human input. But when they start putting robots in the place of humans, you've gone over, over that percentage. It's no longer a 51% human input. 
So is that the ultimate goal? Is that the ultimate goal of fourth density to just make us into man machine or into biobots? Oh, they just want slaves. Yeah. They just want slaves because. But do they want useful slaves? My guess is is that uh, the technology, as we actually understand it, is probably gonna probably gonna be to a great extent destroyed. There's gonna be 4D technology, of course, and that's a whole other ballgame. But that's going to be reserved for you know the the 4D operators, and I think that the human beings they they are grooming and preparing to uh, survive into their 4D hellhole um, are going to be just simply slaves. That's a question I have for you. How, how and Hunter, I know we ask this amongst ourselves when we talk sometimes on our own shows, but like. How does 4D service to others and 4D service to self coexist? They don't coexist in the sense that you think. Because remember, uh, the big rule about 4D SDRs is wishful thinking. Right. Now, you know that if you're, say, on X and you're reading a post from a, a, a woke libtard, and they're talking about this and this and this and this and the other thing when you're reading what they're saying and you're saying to yourself what reality do they live in that they think that that's actually true right and this of course goes back to the your truth my truth rel relativity type thing right and there are actually people you know who they they live in a whole they live in a bubble they live in a different reality than we live in you know because i see what they're saying, and I and I can bring in, and if if I had that person there, and if if they had duct tape on their mouth so they couldn't interrupt me, I I could sit there and bring them facts and data and proof and show them stuff. But you know what? I don't think it would make any difference. Mm -hmm. They would still, even with the facts, even with the data, even with the evidence. They would still refuse the truth. That's living in your own reality. And that's what 40 SDS does to an extent that we can't comprehend because for them, it becomes the reality. So is that reality, though, due to technology mind controlling them? Or it's just a chosen state of being. You know, when when we're talking about 40 SDS, that's because of their wishful thinking that that becomes a reality. Uh, they then, of course, try to suck everybody into their reality, just like any woke libtard does, because, you know, the more people you suck into your reality, because at some level of your subconscious, surely, there's some part of you knows that you're selecting and substituting premises and conclusions, you know, and replacing truth with, you know, these, you know, slipshod, shoddy uh, products of very poor reasoning. So they know at some level, but so that means that they have to draw more people into their bubble of belief system in order to justify and, and to feel comfortable, you know, kind of like the right man syndrome. But for 40 SDS, that very process literally creates their reality. And of course, they too are trying to suck 3D. STS into their reality, and they've been trying to do it for 309,000 years. Insane. I mean, but do you think a 3D SQS, ST, 3D ST, STS person is actually thinking like them or under their mind control? Probably a little of both because. Uh, you know, there's such a wide variation of types of human beings on the planet. I mean, you're familiar with the bell curve of intelligence, right? Okay, well, there's a bell curve for all other kinds of qualities. You know, and there are people who are on this end, people who are on this end, and then the vast majority kind of in the center where the bell is. So <clears throat> there are people who are born who are innately and in their essence probably STF. And just like there are people who are born with a bias 
toward STS. Yeah. But we have to remember that we live in an STS reality. Right. Uh, basically, to a large extent, we are all serious. You know, because we, we can't help but be otherwise because we're composed of these, you know, the smorgasbord of genetic constructions that, you know, kind of run the show, our, our neurochemicals, our brain structure, our you know, the various ways that uh, we operate is uh, genetically set up. And so we have genetic, we have a genetic brain. We have, you know, um, a spiritual brain, so to speak. We have different centers, according to the esoteric tradition. You have the intellectual center, the emotional center, and the, and the moving center. And getting those synchronized. And then, you know, and some people have higher centers that are not quite connected with them and they but they have the capacity the ability through various practices and, and activities and approaches to draw those higher centers in and have them merge with their lower centers not everybody has those higher centers in in, in, in the raw material remember he said Ra said that some beings have that ability innately now is that because they are higher density beings incarnated in third density physical bodies there are some i would say there are certainly some um but my approach is to not rely on that as being you know true for say myself or whatever because um if you if you rely on that kind of thing if you say oh i'm a i'm a star seed and i'm <laughs> I'm a sixth density and I came here to save the world. You know, you're you're just signing your I mean that, that's that's ego. Yeah, that's silly. And when what you really need to do and what you really need to be, and this is something I got from my husband, is you need to be a good workman. You know, be a good workman. You know, you're here, think of yourself as a debugging unit, you know, and and you're gonna help debug the universe. So you know, set about it in the best way you know how and do it and, and, and don't give yourself any uh, airs that you're better. I mean, I, I still do my own laundry and I clean toilets. So um, do I. So I'll never do that. I actually like cleaning toilets. Oh, uh, I'm, I'm not sure I like cleaning toilets. I love cleaning toilets. Yes. Uh, well, I like cleaning <laughs> cars and I like cleaning toilets. Yeah, well, yeah, you can probably depends on who used the toilet too. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now this conversation has gone down the toilet. <laughs> Hunter, did you want to ask her as like a last question for today about Twitter or X? Maybe we could talk about it tomorrow. I just had some thoughts pop into my head this week, Laura, about Twitter being like this giant reality creation machine that has like AI creating narratives that then people get hooked into and then that manifests as reality because that becomes part of their reality. Kind of like to what you were just saying about the SES of like people getting absorbed into like the reality creation. Um, so that was kind of, I just had that random thought pop to me as like, is Twitter or any other platform really? I think Twitter's. No, just really I, I like Twitter because of what Laura said earlier in a different broadcast. It, it seems to attract the most aware people. Yeah, it's great. I love I love it right now. I mean, well, ooh. yeah, because at the very at the very least, you have to be able to read to be on Twitter. That's true. That's well, true. It is one thing. There's a, there's a safeguard. There's always a safeguard. The network, and that's mm. where this is why we have a forum. And why we have so many people from all over the world, you know, contributing information and insights from their own area of the world, you know, so that when something comes up, you know, we have a much better idea of what is really going on as opposed to what the news may tell us or what right. idiots on Twitter yeah. may, you know, conspire to tell us. And I, I've never seen it work as well as it did when COVID began, because we had you know, we had a thread that started, and I mean, we've got millions of views of this thread and tens of thousands of posts because we went through the whole COVID thing with this thread, like going 90 to nothing. I mean, every day, every day. And you couldn't even, 
sometimes it would grow by you know six, seven, eight pages in a day. You can hardly keep up with it because people well, were burning from all more importantly, time. too, those were not bots. Those were not bots. So the reason I say that is, is because whether it's Twitter or other platforms, what your forum doesn't have and what I think makes it so great is there's no bots. So what I Jay and I proved this week is that these fault these people that are writing this stuff, I ran it through, and I don't know how accurate these are, but I ran it through an AI text detection tool. And all these posts are like 95% written by AI. And so it's like, what are people getting sucked into that's like not even human well, written? Yeah, well, the thing is, is that it was announced on Twitter on Thursday. Apparently this problem. Yeah, that they're they're getting rid of the body accounts. They are using this tool to detect bots and to close their accounts. Uh, so hopefully that'll be taken care of. Um, I still have, you know, hope for Twitter helping at least for a while before it gets, you know, taken out and taken out like just about everything else does. Well, I do, I do too. Cause I think it goes back to the sure. network effects, you know, because Twitter is just the tool, but if you create networks on the tool that you can safeguard against like infiltration from those things, or at least where there's like some sort of like a uh, dialogue about it to where it's like, oh, okay, we have a network and that network decides like on like, this is wrong this, or this is false. This is true. And then you can have each other to check each other. I think it works well, but to like you know, what we're talking about with the well, bots. Well, to, to, to Laura, to your credit and to the, to, the, to the C's knowledge base and to you building the technological infrastructure of the Cassie Pin Forum, but just in my limited exposure to you, which has been close to a year now, which is insane because it started actually in May of last year. Well, that's not true. It's longer than a year because you and I read The Secret History, right, Hunter, about what, yeah. two years ago. Mm -hmm. I, I think we told you, we read that book and we were like, you're so deep with the <laughs> our heads explode we had to like decompress a little bit before we could get into the wave series but um but to your credit and again you know to the for the audience listening to this the the cassiopeian forum is the most profound place on planet earth i mean i, I don't say that like to blow smoke i'm saying it because it's true like we can debug just about right away yeah in a day I mean, you throw it up on the forum and you've got, you know, One day. people from all around the world with different skill sets. Yes. yes. Yeah. Investigating and looking at and then reporting back. And we got a terrific team of moderators who keep an eye on, you know, keeping the riffraff out. Trolls. So, you know, yeah. Trolls and bots. So, um, and we try to, I mean, there is a certain decorum we like to maintain, uh, but we're not like, you know, dictators or anything, and you know, about anything can be discussed. As if you discuss it, I, I'm not crazy about people who come on there and say, "Well, I'm a black magician. I want to want to convert you guys." I'm not going to allow. <laughs> more. In, in in truth, I I, I I limit my time on the forum daily because if I stayed any if I if I if I didn't, I wouldn't get any work done in my life. Well, that's how good it is to read. I'm the same way because I want to go on and read and then I will end up reading for like two hours. And then I've realized I don't write anything to contribute when I should be like, at least half the time should be like writing. You have to read for a while because once you, you, you may find that whatever you're thinking about has already been said by somebody, you know, because I mean, it's been going on for a lot of years and there's, you know, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of posts and and readers and oh my god it's it's uh it's unreal it's unreal yeah, it's, it's, and it's, then i would be what i call people in our group about we have the private group for health stuff where we teach people about peptides and hormones and everything and then we're always telling people because people will come in and they'll ask a question that's been answered seventy thousand times and then the other members get mad at them because they're like hey we've been here for this long and we don't want to have to deal with like kindergarten questions when we've been doing that we can easily go look it up function sure. yes. same thing same thing yeah well, i mean my group's three years old you guys are 20 years old but like it's cool because like you said the network i mean we only have 400 plus people in there now but like the network is all people like us yeah so it's like if you get in there and you're a normie quote unquote sheeple you know not not where you should be to be in that group. You're you're exposed and outed immediately, and you leave. And and we don't have to send you packing. You just leave on your own accord. You're like, oh, I'm in the wrong place. 
Yeah, that's what we do. I mean, they there there are some people that you know slide by for a while, but they, they do it because you know they they're tricky. They're they're slimy, and they yeah. uh, they'll slide by for a while, being super super nice. And then finally some issue will come up that triggers them. And then you see who and what they really are. And then they're out the door, gone to Rooney, you know, sayonara. So, Peace out. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll, we'll wrap, uh, we'll wrap for today and we'll pick up tomorrow. Um, but another amazing show. Um, Laura, we appreciate you being here today. And, and of course, for all these shows, Hunter, do you have anything else to say? Or we'll just shut it down for tomorrow. Okay. I said for me, uh, as always, thank you, Lori. I'm going to try always. to see what my explosion was. It happened at 5.45, my time. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll talk to you tomorrow. I have somebody that's actually at my home right now, too. So I love all of you guys. We'll see you guys tomorrow.